Awesome. We'll get started. All right. Um, thank you so much for everyone who is in attendance today. Um, this is our first CCB skill seminar of this fall 2021 semester. Um, this one is all virtual, but subsequent seminars are going to be a hybrid format and we'll be serving lunch hopefully afterwards. So hopefully um, you get really excited by this talk and want to keep coming to these seminars. Um, this has been, I think, an exciting venue for just all sorts of different types of uh, tools and, and ideas um, to be disseminated to our community. Um, just some uh, quick housekeeping items. I've linked the CTV skill seminar um, GitHub um, uh, page to this chat right here. So you can go and look at all of our old recordings and resources and the Google form as well, which I'll send out at the very end of the seminar. Um, I think that's all the rest of the seminars are gonna be this 12 to one uh, slot. Um, so hopefully you can schedule this in once a month, um, the uh, second Wednesday of every month. Okay, so with logistics aside, I want to introduce today Joseph Min. Um, he is a PhD student at MIT um, in the EECS department. He's co-advised by Jonathan Weissman and uh, Nir Yosef, and he's uh, a very stellar computational biologist. And he previously has done a lot of work on uh, RNA quantification using the KB or close to bus tools pipeline, which he'll be talking to us about today. So um, with that all said, Joseph, we're really excited to have you here today and I'll let you take it away. Awesome, thanks, Matt. Uh, also, uh, thanks, Matt and Adam for inviting me to this talk. Uh, very excited to talk about this today. Um, so essentially what, what I'm going to be going over today is how, uh, from a both like a high level and also a technical and practical aspects of how you can quickly and efficiently pre-process your signals of RNA-seq data with this particular uh, pipeline called Colosso and Bus Tools. And so uh, before we jump, in, we jump in, I'd like to give you a brief um, introduction, I guess. Uh, so before we go into like the nitty gritty and um, how exactly the pipeline works, I'd like to take a, a thousand foot view of uh, the objective of why we actually do single cell RNA sequencing. So, okay, single cell RNA sequencing. We've heard this uh, term a lot. It's uh, the craze. It's been the craze for a uh, few years now. And everyone, everybody seems to run their uh, a single cell RNA seq experiment to profile new cells or to do what, what's called RNA velocity analysis or uh, many other things as well. And I think it's useful to uh, decompose this, to figure out what this, what we actually mean by this, to decompose this into two parts. And the obvious decomposition, first decomposition, is to uh, see what RNA sequencing is. So RNA sequencing is an assay that has been around for quite a while to sequence mRNA present in a biological sample. And this mRNA, the level of mRNA present in the sample, we use as a proxy for the degree of gene expression in the sample. And I say it's a proxy because it's obviously not 100% sampling of the cell. There is going to be stuff that just doesn't get tra transcribed or does not get uh, captured efficiently by uh, the RNA sequencing method, uh, even though uh, those transcripts might be present abundantly in the, in the cell. There's also many other factors that affect gene expression, like uh, methylation or epigenetic factors that we really can't capture with simply RNA sequencing. But it, it has been shown time and time again that this is a rather robust and good proxy to figure out what, uh, the, what kind of genes a cell or what kind of genes the sample expresses. And now we bring in a little twist uh, to make this single cell level. And now this is uh, single cell RNA sequencing is an assay to identify and quantify the amount of mRNA present for each cell separately. And the, the great thing about this is that now, since we, have, we know uh, we can map each mRNA molecule to what cell that it came from, we can use this information to uh, define an mRNA state, or we also like to call gene expression state for each cell. 
And what this eventually boils, boils down to is that we can define um, a cell state, uh, a particular state for each cell and say, oh, these particular groups of cells, I don't know, are represent uh, progen um, represents like T cells or some type of immune cells or uh, in a developmental uh, pathway. And so this seems all, all good. We, we can now look at the mRNA in single cells and that, that theoretically should give us a lot more information, a lot more power to figure out what is happening in the underlying biology. But there's also, uh, in doing so, there's a lot of challenges that um, the field has been thinking about for quite a long time. And uh, I'd like to go over a few of those first. So compared to, uh, I'm going to refer to as just regular RNA sequencing as bulk RNA seq. And I use this terminology because um, essentially what you're doing with conventional RNA sequencing that's not single cell is you harvest the tissue, dissociate it, and sequence the entire sample that cons may consist of, I don't know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of cells. Essentially what you're getting at that point is an aggregate uh, mRNA expression of that entire sample. And so moving to single cell, the first problem is how do we separate our pool of cells into individual cells so that we can um, figure out where where each mRNA molecule or, originates from. And um, the most popular way, I would say, is now to isolate single cells is through microfluidic uh, <clears throat> cell sorting, in which um, you can encapsulate single cells with high accuracy. Of course, sometimes you're going to get doublets. But with rather high accuracy, you can isolate single cells into each of these nano droplets. And what this allows you to do is to perform um, some type of reaction within these micro droplets so that each cell undergoes these um, reactions in an isolated environment. The second question would be, so okay, now we know how to separate these cells into these nano droplets, they're isolated, it's all good, but how do we eventually map each mRNA to, the set, to that particular cell? And how we do that is, uh, there's a very variety of ways, or what I like to call um, single cell technologies, um, that get at this problem. I'm going to focus on one of the more common methods, and it's also the method that's used by 10x uh, Genomics. And so what you do is you have a bunch of nano beads that have uh, these uh, DNA oligomers attached to them, and each of these um, each of these beads have its unique cell barcode, and this is the barcode that barcode sequence that is unique for each bead. And um, you put these beads along into each of these droplets along with the cell, the the individual cell, and in, and by doing so, you can essentially capture all the mRNA from that particular cell on a single bead. And the capture is done by this poly DT priming because we know that mRNA is poly A, poly A tailed. Yeah, and so, <clears throat> but okay, so we solved that second problem. So we can tell using this um, using this cell barcode, we are able to rather confidently tell which M which cell the mRNA originated from. Now comes a little bit more tricky problem because we're dealing with single cells and they have a lot each of these droplets are going to have much fewer mRNA than compared to bulk RNA sequencing and therefore usually uh, single cell RNA sequencing requires much deeper sequencing to be able to get a um, good readout from the diverse mRNA present and the problem with this is um, when we prepare this reaction in, in these nano droplets, which contains the beads and the cell, what we do is uh, once we uh, do the particular reaction to tag them with these prime with these uh, sequences, and then uh, digest them, we also then go through multiple rounds of PCR amplification so that we can get enough 
uh, of the mRNA molecules so that we can sequence them properly. Uh, the problem is um, during that process, certain transcripts or certain mRNA molecules will be maybe more likely to be PCR amplified. They're more happy to be amplified compared to others, maybe sequences that are much longer uh, that don't uh, like to be amplified as, as much. And so by, because of that, there's going to be a lot of bias depending on what, depending on various conditions of particular transcripts versus another. And we need a way to tell uh, those differences to be able to exactly tell each molecule, each original molecule apart. And that's where we use this particular UMI sequence. Uh, the UMI is short for Unique Molecular Identifier, which is essentially a random uh, sequence of bases that by using it, we can tell um, what tell the difference between a PCR duplicate and uh, like different mRNA molecule that was in the original cell. Awesome. Um, let me just. Okay. So okay, now we solved all these problems. So now uh, let me. Is there is there any questions so far before I move on? Okay. Awesome. So now we go into a little bit more technical side. So now uh, I've introduced you to all the three, all the um, caveats, I guess, in terms of the read structure, which going over them again is the cell barcode, which uniquely identify, identifies the cell, as well as the UMI, which um, is a unique sequence per mRNA molecule within each cell. And also, of course, there is the, there's the biological sequence that we're interested in, which, is, which I will call the cDNA, and this is the actual mRNA sequence uh, that was in the cell. And the single-cell RNA-seq molecule, uh, sorry, single-cell RNA-seq objective is to identify and quantify the mRNA that was present in each cell. But we can uh, update this a little by using these terminologies that we just described into um, this new, a, li a bit more technical objective, which is first to identify which biological transcript or gene gave rise to the mRNA, and second, to count the number of unique M UMIs for each cell barcode. And some caveats to doing so is, first, there's always going to be errors or sequencing errors in particular. The sequencers are not 100% perfect. So how are we going to deal with those, those problems? And second is regarding UMI counting. So although I said each UMI is unique for each mRNA molecule, um, it really depends on how, how long that sequence is and how the assay was designed. And there may be cases where distinct mRNAs are tagged with the same UMI sequence just by pure chance. And so another caveat is how are we going to deal with these uh, so-called UMI collisions. And these are, these are some of the problems that the field has struggled for a long time, and we have very good ideas of how to tackle each of these issues. And also there's a lot of variety of tools, variety of pipelines that have uh, been developed to make this process as seamless as possible. Today, but today I'll be talking about one particular tool, which is using uh, two of the tools that was developed in the Pachter lab, called Callisto and Bus Tools. So uh, let me just go over briefly what each of these tools individually do. So Callisto, you might be familiar uh, with the term because Callisto was initially developed for a bulk RNA-seq um, to perform pseudo-alignment of bulk RNA-seq samples. Specifically, Callisto is a pseudo-aligner that identifies which biological transcript or gene gave rise to the mRNA. So this tackles the first part of the modified single-cell RNA-seq objective that I talked about earlier. And it's part, specifically a pseudo-aligner. And the way I think like to think about pseudo-alignment versus alignment is uh, digital versus an how we compare digital versus analog signals. For pseudo-alignment, you're more interested in whether or not, or true, a true or false question, whether this particular mRNA molecule maps to this other particular gene. Whereas for alignment, you are interested in both the degree to which they align and which specific bases align 
whether there was a gap or a deletion or, or substitution, etc. The second particular tool uh, that's part of this pipeline is the bus tools. It's called bus tools, and this is a tool to interact with what we call bus files. This is a custom file format that was developed specifically for efficient pre-processing of single cell data. And you, we also use this tool to count the UMIs. Of course, there's other functionalities such as uh, barcode correction, uh, UMI collapsing, etc. And using these two software, we can now uh, set up an entire pipeline to go from um, first your sequencing reads, which will be in FASTQ format. You can imagine this is from some any droplet-based assay such as 10x, DropSeq, etc., or SmartSeq or a uh, bulk as well. So, yeah, and you would use Callisto to get your pseudo alignments, which would be in the form of a bus file. And then finally, use you would use bus tools to obtain your final uh, final product, which is your UMIs per gene or transcript per cell. And this will be in the format of a matrix of cell by genes or transcripts. And the great thing about this particular pipeline is that this can be adapted for a variety of tasks. So the most common would be to do just regular transcriptome profiling, for instance, to profile cells to figure out uh, what types of cells are present and find out their gene expression signatures. Another that can be used, uh, another that can be obtained from this pipeline is to get your splicing information. For instance, you can compute how many reads were spliced versus how many reads were unspliced. And this is particularly useful for performing RNA velocity analyses, uh, which I will go over in, in the coming slides. OK, so we have this nice pipeline. We, we can perform full quantification of FASTQs to your gene expression matrix. And I'd like to take a brief moment to convince you of why I think we, sh we should all use Callisto and bus tools. So first, it's, it's very fast. Um, it is up to 100 times faster than other tools. Um, and this is in particularly because first, pseudo alignment itself is much faster, uh, is a much faster algorithm. Furthermore, there's, they, we, um, there are various algorithm improvements that were made uh, in the pseudo alignment algorithm. And if you're interested, although I won't be going into these in depth because today's tutorial is more uh, focused on practical uses. If you're interested, I, I'd highly suggest you go to um, either the Callisto uh, publication or the Bus Tools publication, as they both should um, dive deeper into what, what these specifically are. Uh, furthermore, it, Callisto Bus Tools is very efficient. You can essentially perform full uh, transcriptome profiling with less than four gig gigabytes of RAM. And for RNA splicing assays, you need around 16 to 32, which might also seem, which might seem like a, a bit much, but we are actively developing ways to uh, make this a lot smaller. And um, this is currently in development and we expect that this should be decreased significantly in, in once, once we have, have this in full, full swing. And finally, the Callisto Bus Tools pipeline is very modular and customizable. It can be easily adapted for custom experimental assays. Uh, the example that I like to use is Callisto and Bus Tools, this pipeline can be used to capture custom sequences that contain orthogonal data. And by orthogonal data, I like to, I mean either to demultiplex your samples or to quantify cell surface proteins, uh, et cetera. What all of these uh, advantages amount to is that you can perform with this pipeline full single cell RNA seq preprocessing on a standard lo laptop in a matter of minutes to a few hours. Of course, it depends on how many the size of your data, but this can make the difference between having to uh, hog the CPU time on your cluster for I don't know uh, days to or even weeks to uh, just maybe a few hours. And in particular, I'd like to focus on uh, what we call KB Python, which is a wrapper for this full workflow. It's a feature-rich wrapper for the Callisto Bus Tools preprocessing pipeline. 
And the great thing about this tool is that it greatly abstracts out the particular commands and what order you need to, um, you need to issue them. So usually if you were to use um, Colesso and bus tools, their binaries just uh, uh, separately, you would have to know what commands to issue at what point and this can get a lot a very quite complicated for specific assays and the great thing about this uh, wrapper is that it abstracts all that out to into essentially two intuitive steps that and those two steps are all that you need to worry about okay so this from here on it's going to be a bit more practical so feel free to <clears throat> there's going to be a Google Collab um, links um, going forward and um, bash commands that uh, you are fe feel free to uh, follow along with you also feel free to open the Collab notebook and go through them as well but before I do that are there any questions Oh, awesome. Okay, so let me just first go through how you would install this uh, tool. It is just a Python package that's in the Python package index. So you can install them with pip. This will, uh, the first command will install the release version, which tends to be much more stable. Uh, you can also try out the development version that will have a lot more new features. But of course, as the name implies, may be less stable. Than the state than the official counterpart. Awesome. Okay, let me just go through briefly how the two uh, set steps that running using this tool implies or requires. First is called KB ref, and what this command does is it splits the genome according to the transcript annotations and constructs the pseudo alignment index to which you're going to align your reads. Uh, and then the second uh, is KB count, which essentially does the UMI counting. It performs pseudo alignment, cell barcode correction, optional filtering, and counts UMIs. And one thing to note is that uh, the KB ref, you only ever have to run this once for each uh, particular reference that you want to use. And the inputs to this command would be your genome sequences in FASTA format, as well as your gene annotations in GTF format. And what this command will spit out is a variety of things. It will first spit out the cDNA sequences. Uh, so essentially, this is just your um, X, basically exons. Uh, you could think of it that way. And also intron sequences, if you specify that you will be using this for splicing analysis. Additionally, um, it'll spit out the pseudo alignment index and the transcriptome to gene mapping. Um, so you might be wondering why we opted to use the genome sequences and the annotations instead of just taking in a cDNA sequence directly. Because if you might, you might be aware that um, Ensemble, for instance, already provides the split cDNA uh, sequences that you might want to use. The problem with this approach is that we found um, after painfully going through like painfully like evaluating each each one we found that there the ensemble cDNA sequences are not um, consistent with the G gene annotations that they themselves provide so essentially the cDNA sequences that ensemble provides contains novel transcripts that are not in the GTF and the GTF contains uh, transcripts that are not in the cDNA uh, and I'm still not 100% sure why they designed it like this, but we, we thought that it's much better to uh, split the genome ourselves in a controlled setting like this. Uh, for, and then using all of these, you will then run KB count. And for this particular co command, you would obviously pr provide your read sequences as fast cues. And also what we call a single cell technology definition. I'll go this. I'll go into this a little bit more depth later. But it's essentially a way of telling KB what um, single cell technology you use. Did you use 10x? Did you use DropSeq, etc. 
You would also provide uh, in the pseudo alignment index and the transcriptome to gene mapping into KB count, which will neatly provide you with an unfiltered or filtered gene or transcript expression matrix, depending on the options you used. So the format of this would be the cell by gene matrix or cell by transcript matrix. Some options of interest that may be useful for each of these commands. First for KB ref is uh, this include attribute and exclude attribute. These options control whether you want to um, exclude certain GTF entries or in, on, include only uh, GTF, certain GTF entries. And this is useful for when, for instance, you want to, you don't want to care about pseudo genes or you don't want to care about certain like non-coding genes that may be annotated as uh, cDNA sequences or transcripts, sorry. And for uh, KB count, some options of interest is these two output uh, options, which converts the output matrix to H5AD or Loom format so that it can be used directly by any downstream uh, analysis pipelines. The TCC option, which, and by providing, the, providing this option, you would be quantifying your transcripts or AKA ISO, gene isoforms instead of uh, collapsing all the counts into individual genes. Um, just T and M, which specifies the thread and RAM limit, and also uh, dash dash filter, which would perform a uh, rudimentary form of self filtering for you, as well as uh, the last option is uh, quite very very useful for me actually. I've used this a lot. It <clears throat> is the dry run option, in which if you provide this option, it'll print all the commands that would be run, instead of actually running them. And the really cool thing about this is if you provide this option, you can essentially pipe the output to a bash script and then run the bash script, which would essentially be uh, perform behave exactly the same as if you would be running KB. And this is very useful for just trying to figure out what type, types of commands uh, to run, if you're not familiar with that, or just to do some sanity checks as well. Okay, so now let me go through a few um, tutorials or a few walkthroughs actually. So first we're going to go through a standard workflow. This is your uh, run of the mill conventional single cell RNA-seq experiment where the focus is to get single cell gene expression profiles. And <clears throat> as, bef as mentioned previously, this will be divided into two separate steps. The first step you won't have to run if you already have a built index, but um, for the sake of completeness, let me go through the entire um, pipeline. Um, just double checking, can everybody see my screen with the collab notebook? Yeah? Yeah. Are we good? Yeah. We can, okay. I can see it. So we're okay, moving. awesome. Yeah, so for some reason, the green border disappeared for me for Zoom. So uh, not sure why, but we will. We will be fine. Okay. So for this particular example, we're going to use the mouse retinal cells from Corin et al. You can go to the paper if you'd like to learn more about what they're doing. Um, and the particular genome FASTA and annotation GTF, we're using the mouse ensemble release one, 104. So first, um, as always, oh, for those who aren't familiar with Colab, it's a, it's, you can essentially think of it as a cloud Jupyter notebook. It's provided by Google and it comes with a lot of pre-installed um, Python packages that like, for instance, matplotlib, um, NumPy, etc. It's originally designed for machine learning applications, but it, it's also very useful for doing tutorials like these. Um, would highly recommend. So what I'm doing here right now is, is I'm installing a bunch of uh, Python libraries that are needed. You can see that here, I'm also install, installing KB. So this should finish up uh, rather shortly. All right, in the meantime, um, I also have a cell to download all the data, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to mount my um, Google Drive because downloading this data, you. I think it takes around 10 minutes, but yeah, it's much faster if we just, if I just mount it. So one second.
Awesome. Okay. So now we're ready to actually go through the pipeline. So first, as, as I mentioned earlier, you need to build the index. And for this particular command, you provide um, uh, dash I provide the path to the pseudonym index you want to generate, as well as the transcript to transcript home to gene mapping. And finally, the cDNA FASTA that it will generate. The two inputs are, as I mentioned earlier, the genome sequences, as well as the gene annotations, GTF. And you can see that exactly, that's exactly what I did here. And it, what it will do is um, just split the genome into transcripts and then index it, generating uh, the specified files. You can see that this finished in 12 minutes. And that's also why I'm not going to run this explicitly. And now you're ready to actually perform uh, quantification. For quantification, you would provide kb count, dash i, your previously built index, dash g, your previously uh, generated transcriptome to gene mapping, and by dash x, you would specify a technology string. And let me let me just briefly go over what this means. So, um, so in this, if you look over here, I say dash x, 10x v2, and this specifies that I'm this these set of fast queues were generated using 10x genomics 3 prime, 3 prime version 2 technology. Uh, there's also a variety of other technologies that are supported. So you can look you can look at those by doing kb dash dash list, which should print out yes. So these are all the technologies that are supported in this version. Uh, so you can see 10x v1, v2, v3, cell seek, drop seek, in drops, etc. And you would be providing any one of these names to uh, the dash x. Followed by the H5AD option. As I mentioned earlier, this is so that the output matrix is automatically converted to an H5AD um, file. Dash T2, so uh, use two threads, output all the output files to this um, directory. And then finally, your, your input fast queues. And doing so, it'll it'll do a bunch of things in the in the background, in the back, in, under the hood. One of the good thing, one of the cool things is that um, some of you might know that 10x version two and also version three, and also version one, <laughs> has a predefined bar, cell barcode whitelist. And usually, what you would have to do is you would have to go to Google, do 10x version three whitelist, and go through wherever it takes you to download. And sometimes, and I'm pretty sure it, it's only in, included in their like Cell Ranger pipeline. So you would have to download the Cell Ranger pipeline, go to this particular directory, uh, find wherever that is buried. But the cool thing about KB is that uh, for technologies that it knows there is the Cell barcode whitelist, it will automatically um, copying a, copy a prepackaged whitelist. It will use that automatically. So you don't have to go through uh, the painful process of downloading Cell Ranger, which in itself takes quite a while. Um, yeah, and, I, and I've done that multiple times. And so you see, um, it eventually out outputs uh, the matrix into this path in four minutes, seven seconds. And let me just go through doing some basic quality control. This, this part of the analysis is heavily adapted from the ScanPy tutorial, so if you're um, interested, please uh, take a look. So what I'm doing here, I'm importing a bunch of um, useful packages and also reading the end data file or gene expression matrix that was output by KB. And you can see that we have 96,649 cells. And I'm going to use air quotes here because some of them aren't real, real cells. They, they're, just, they're just usually noise and 55,416 genes. And we can, um, as, as you might be aware, we can just look at this, uh, the PCA decomposition under, with two components. Um, this should generate this rather quickly. Yeah, you can see that there's uh, some kind of separation, but this doesn't tell you uh, really much. The important thing I would like to go through is the neat plot which was originally described in the drop seed paper. And the neat prop plot is very useful in determining how many uh, real cells, like determining your real cell threshold. 
because usually in these droplet based technologies, you'll get empty droplets that just uh, happen to capture um, like mRNA floating around uh, somehow in the mixture or uh, doublets as well. Um, so yeah, so essentially what this plot is showing is um, it's a ranked order um, plot where the x-axis indicates the number of UMIs for each cell <clears throat> and the y-axis is um, the rank order, essentially. And so the knee plot can be used to threshold cells based on their number of UMI counts they contain. The threshold is applied at the knee, or you can also think of this as, as the inflection point, where there's a sharp drop off in the number of UMIs per cell. Um, so you can see that the actual inflection point is probably around here. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that is because that's log uh, scale. But here we're going to use this particular number, 3979, because that's actually used as a number in the publication. So you can see, yeah, but usually uh, when you're doing an experiment, you don't really know how many cells to expect. So this is a good plot to look at. So then I'm filtering out these uh, uh, empty droplets, which gives you 3,531, and dare I say real cells here. Um, Joseph, I have a quick question. So it makes a lot of sense yeah. why you have an inflated number of cells, but um, I'm interested in what index or what transcriptome you used to align your reads to. Uh, 55,000 genes uh, seems inflated as well. So is this, are these not, um, isoforms or is this, yeah, just give us more information about 55,000. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. So um, yes, these are isoforms. Um, so, KB, when it generates the matrix, it uses the gene versions to differentiate. So if, if you look at, if you ever look through a genome annotation, you would sometimes see gene name, I don't know, um, KRAS, let's say, and then there's a gene ID that starts with like ENS something something, but there's also a gene version that usually specifies the isoform. And so KB um, separates those out and um, that and that's why you would tend to see inflated um, numbers. We can actually take a look at this uh, in real time. So yeah, you see that the dot two, everything after the dot indicates the gene version. And so to get something like, um, to essentially get rid of this, to collapse um, into actual like genes, you would have to um, just sum the the rows that have the same prefix, everything at before the the period. And actually, yeah, that's one of the things that I've been thinking about. Maybe it would be useful to include that, but I really haven't gotten a, a around to it. Thanks for the question, though. That's a, that's a really good question. Thanks for the answer. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. And um, I'm. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through um, the rest um, because we're almost out of time. But uh, what we can also do is filter out by mitochondrial content because high mitochondrial genes may, may be indicative of high apoptosis or a cell lysis. But also like for tumors, apparently there can be high mitochondrial content natively. So you can filter out by those as well. See um, like the distribution of your uh, how many genes were expressed in each cell, the total number of UMIs per cell, and the percentage of mitochondrial genes present in each cell. <clears throat> and finally, um, this is uh, usually done very often, or actually probably every single single cell paper now does this. You would do lighter clustering um, to essentially um, find cell states and annotate those. Uh, but here I just indicated them by indexes, but you can you can go through each of these and find uh, marker genes, uh, compare them with um, published marker genes and figure out, oh, hey, this, this um, particular cluster corresponds to this one cell population, whereas this other cluster corresponds to another cell population. Awesome. Oh. And let me just uh, go through the next one. Okay, 
So the next one is RNA velocity. This is, uh, I'm also not going to go through like this manually because it takes a lot longer, but you can also uh, go through this by yourself by opening the Collab Notebook using the badge. So the difference here is you need to provide a few more options such as uh, <clears throat> where to output the introns. Um, and you see these two additional options called C1 and C2. These essentially are like the transcript names that correspond to cDNA and transcript names that correspond to introns that need to be provided later on. And finally, uh, workflow. Uh, we named the RNA, our RNA velocity workflow Lamano because Lamano uh, et al. was the first paper that described RNA velocity and it's a nice, we thought it was a nice homage. Yeah, so for this particular um, walkthrough, we are actually using that exact data set. It's the human week 10 fetal four brain data set. And so we go through downloading the data, um, installing KB Python. And in this particular case, we don't build the reference ourselves. We use, we download a pre-built index and that's one of the options for KB as well. So by providing this D option, uh, there's a variety of um, indices that are, uh, that are available pre-built like the human one and uh, mouse one, I believe, as well as the, a very basic human brain one, it's specifically for RNA velocity. And so that particular one is called Linarsen, um, which is also a homage to the, uh, the paper that generated this data set. Yeah, but uh, we download a pre-built index, extract those at the relevant uh, paths, and we run the basically the exact same command with a little caveats. First is this workflow Lamano, which specifies uh, that we are quantifying our, our we are quantifying spliced and unspliced transcripts, and also we are doing an additional filtering step so that um, because this is a very large data set, and usually if we don't filter out these, Colab might crash when loading the AND data, and that's why uh, we we actually do the filtering through Callisto and Bus Tools in this case. And yeah, um, the rest of it is taken pretty much directly from the Lamano et al. analysis. And so you can go through them um, by yourself as well. Essentially what we do is um, we do use the VeloCyto and SCVelo to compute RNA velocity. And what we can get is eventually a very nice uh, RNA velocity plot like this, which um, <clears throat> which indicates the, which in theory indicates the developmental tra trajectory of each cell. All right, awesome. And are there any questions so far? All right, and uh, the last walkthrough, I'd like to actually go through this in a little bit more depth because this, I think this is a very cool application. So we developed what, what is called the KITE workflow, which is short for Callisto Indexing and Tag Extraction. And this is uh, very, this is related to what I referred to previously where you can use KB, <clears throat> Callisto bus tools to quantify custom sequences to capture orthogonal data. And for this particular example, I'm going to use the 10X version and they specifically call their technology 10x feature barcoding. Um, and you can look this up in Google and it'll show you a lot of uh, nice infographics. But essentially what you do is you have these um, antibodies with um, DNA tags, poly DT tags, or not poly DT, poly um, nucleotide tags. And what it can do is you can capture these sequences uh, which bind to the self-surface proteins. And this is especially useful for, for instance, um, to be able to use these self-surface proteins to uh, further your cell type annotations because we know that cell surface markers are very useful in identifying immune populations, for instance. Yeah, so essentially you can use uh, Callisto bus tools to quantify these as well orthogonally. And in this case, um, two differences compared to the previous ones is that for the workflow, you would just provide kite as um, the name implies, but also now we're providing a features 
TSV instead of like a fast cues or anything like that. For oh, for ref, sorry, instead of a fast dot or a gene annotation, um, and followed by a KB count, which is uh, basically the same. I forgot to include the fast cues, but let's imagine they're there. Okay, so for this one, I'm actually going to download the data. So, are there any questions? It, this should take like I don't know one or two minutes. I have a quick question. So it seems like this right here is for workflows for antibody labeling of, of um, epitopes. Have you imagined using this for demultiplexing pipelines for like multi-seq or um, other types of demultiplexing pipelines? Yeah, actually it does work. We, we actually have a paper that we're working on that we show it's very applicable to a lot of technologies, including like CRISPR uh, labeling as well, I believe. Like um, it's I think it's called CRISPR-Seq, okay. the particular yeah technology. <laughs> but yeah, we we definitely tested it with multi-seq as well. That's awesome. Good to know. Okay, while we're waiting, let me just briefly. I'm just gonna queue this up real quick. Let me just show like briefly tell you what this is actually doing. So essentially what you need this what this features TSV is is it's a two column table where the first column indicates your antibody ID the second column is your antibody sequences and what KB ref does is it constructs one having mismatches for all for all one having mismatches for all those sequences and uses that to index and this is important because we uh, there can be sequencing errors um, within these sequences. Um, and so building this mismatch index allows us to cap still accurately identify which antibody sequence uh, it was. Okay, it seems like it was it finished downloading. And oh, we're also going to download um, their particular, the 10x feature ref CSV. This contains all the inf antibody information. And we also we download it directly from 10x. So we will do that right now. Okay, looking at this, uh, we actually we do see the ID like these are the antibody IDs, the first column, um, and this particular column, the sequence indicates the antibody sequence or like the identification sequence. This is the sequence that we will use to uh, uh, pseudo line to, so that we can tell which uh, sequence maps to which antibody. And we essentially generate this uh, features TSV to provide into KB ref. And as you can see here, uh, it generates a one Hamming distance mismatch FASTA file and it indexes it, it already finished because it's a pretty small um, sample. And finally, we will run KB count, same as always, use dash dash H5AD to generate the eight and data file. This time we're using a 10x version three. Uh, so I'm providing dash x uh, 10x v3 followed by workflow kite. Yeah, and this should take a hot minute, but once we are, uh, I will not wait for this because we're almost out of time. So essentially what we can do is we can read this in and if you take a look, it will have the cell barcodes, but for the columns, instead of genes now, it will have each of those features. And we will have counts for how many UMIs for each of those features was uh, aligned in your sample. And yeah, using this, you can see how many uh, of those, each of those antibodies were captured. Additionally, you can, you can just use those antibody counts to do uh, clustering and essentially see um, essentially color, what I did here was color each of these uh, cells with um, their each of these antibody expression. So you can see CD3 is mostly expressed in this particular region as well as a little bit of this region and so on and so forth. Yeah. And yeah, so essentially that's uh, what I wanted to show. So to wrap up, if you are interested in, so here I went over very briefly and I gloss over a lot of details, but 
we have a lot more in-depth tutorials that walk you through step by step, describing to you exactly what the rationale is for each step in our website. <clears throat> uh, we're also working hard to include SmartC uh, version 3 support. And SmartC version 3 is very interesting because you're able to capture five prime and mRNA with UMIs, but also internal like non-UMI sequences, just like regular SmartC. So it, it requires a bit more juggling, data juggling, but it we we do have that implemented as well as uh, compiling cholesterol to, and bus tools binaries locally so that we can support basically every operating system and architecture. All right, with that, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have questions, comments? That was awesome, Joseph. Uh, I'll make sure to upload all these uh, tutorials. Yeah, I'll. Thanks. I'll, um, yeah, I'll make sure to give you a link to this Dropbox too. Yeah. Great, and I'll uh, put that on our website. Uh, first, I just want to say that this has been recorded, so we can take some time uh, to answer questions over. But if you do need to go, uh, just please fill out that, um, that form I sent out. But um, I think that's only logistics. I just want to say again, Joseph, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And like I said, we can stay on the call and field any questions should people have mm -hmm. any. Yeah, thank you for having me. I hope uh, this tutorial was, this presentation was helpful and that, um, yeah, that it'll help you in your research, especially. Definitely. Joseph, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. I think the obvious question is like, how does this compare to Cell Ranger? Um, I assume that you guys have done some, or this pipeline, the, the Callisto bus tools, like, are there any downsides? What, um, what comparisons have you guys done on that? So, yeah, that's a good question. So since you're saying uh, Cell Ranger, I'm going to assume that this is for 10X. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm mostly over 10X or, or anything else if you, but how does it compare to other tools, but maybe namely things with use for 10X? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, in our paper, we did an explicit comparison with uh, Cell Ranger, and it's nearly identical. I don't think I think the differences were mostly noise. Um, the major difference was um, obviously the runtime and the memory requirements. Um, one of the things, though, if so, one of the like the reason why Callisto bus tools is so fast, of course, is is we use uh, pseudo alignment, and though this is very useful, um, it can you might like. So first of all, um, Cell Ranger uses star internally, right? Um, and it's it's just a regular aligner. If you're interested in the exact mutations that happen, uh, I don't think Callisto bus tools is a tool to use in its current state until we figure out how to do that, um, which we're actively working. But in terms of just regular uh, cell type profiling, uh, I I personally always use um, Callisto bus tools. I <clears throat> Once I figured out how to use Callisto bus tools, I never looked back at Cell Ranger. Um, comparatively, using Cell Ranger for um, like the comparisons in the paper alone were very painful. Um, personally, but what, of what course there's that, a, sorry? so this is, this might be going into a bit nitty gritty, but, um, installing Cell Ranger itself takes a while because you need to download the, bin the, the, what is archive and unarchive it, which contains like a ton of files, right? And Yeah, yeah. To answer your question, we saw no difference. Um, you can also take a look at our paper for a more in-depth analysis. We saw no difference and other than um, improved runtime and memory. All right, thank you. Yeah, do you, uh, if, we'll take a look at the paper. That seems reasonable too. Yep. I would just say for me, it seems really nice that you can put KB tools in a Python notebook and have like a full pipeline, especially with the focus on reproducibility workflows nowadays, like having a mm -hmm. notebook like that is a really big advantage, at least thinking about my own analysis. Yeah, I think, I think, I think, I think so too.
that's uh it's it's really nice to be able to go through like a full pre-processing in one sitting maybe not maybe not in like a couple minutes because it does take a bit longer than that uh, but being able to run through everything in like a two core i think 12 gig machine on collab i think it's amazing yes yeah, so that's my biggest interest in, in this as well uh matt is just like you know while a lot of people do have access to clusters those that don't or people that i know that don't have clusters are not readily available or don't want to have to deal with like some of the annoying red tape that involve with like public clusters um like savio for instance may oh, want to yeah. use this so like you know um and there's like uh, I, I, I still use Cell Ranger, or I, I use Cell Ranger, but I, I definitely know people that um, are trying to do single cell data that will likely encounter issues with that. So um, I'm just trying to compare alternatives, and this does seem like much faster. Um, I mean, I, I know that when I was doing bulk sequencing a long time ago, uh, alignment, mm -hmm. I was like shocked that Callisto was so fast, like alone when it was first published. Like I, I thought they should have put an option in there to slow it down because it seemed like it wasn't working at first. So I ran it a few times because like this is it must have aired out. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, that that's exactly my experience too. Uh when, <laughs> when I used to do bulk RNA sequencing, it was crazy. But yeah, um yeah, if you're interested in like the also like how it's so fast, it yeah, it the paper will be the colossal paper actually describes it very nicely. Um it's essentially you don't have to compare every camer to do pseudo alignment because of the particular way the index is prepared, which contributes to the most speed up, I think, of Callisto. All right, awesome. I think um, those are all the questions. Again, Matt and Adam, thanks for having me. It was, it was, a, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for presenting. No problem. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so like I said, we'll put all the resources on our website. And if you have any other questions about the seminar going forward or with regards to this talk, feel free to reach out to one of the organizers or Joseph himself. Um, we'll see you all next month. Thank you. <laughs>